Hi, I'm Lisa Johnson, and this is my learning summary for WCET 2014, held in Portland, Oregon. WCET, for those of you that don't know, is the WICHE Cooperative on Educational Technologies, and they sponsor an annual meeting each year that's always invigorating in terms of the learning about what's happening in higher ed and especially what's coming in higher education as well. So without further ado, the first large session I want to summarize my learning from is the Do-It-Yourself University Education Revolution session by Anya Kamenetz. She is the lead education blogger for NPR, and her biography at the website notes she's the author of several books including those you might have heard of regarding the future of education, such as Generation Debt, which tackled the topic of youth economics and politics, her book that's famous, Do-It-Yourself University, Edupunks, Edupreneurs, and the Coming Transformation of Higher Ed from 2010 is notable from its investigations of innovations related to cost, access, and quality in higher education. And she has a new book coming out next year in 2015 titled The Test, which gives a historical account and prophecies about test use in schools in the United States. Her keynote was really well received by me and several others in the room, and there's the discussion really was around hot topics in learning, including online learning and innovations deriving from the ubiquitous nature of opportunities to learn, both formally and informally, today in the United States and beyond. Following the keynote, a question and answer session included questions about where higher education is headed. And, you know, Kamenet's responses all seem proactive and positive to me, with a key point being that the strength she sees of the industry of higher education is its diversity. That comment really appealed to my anthropological roots and that any species with diversity at its core is more likely to adapt well to changing ecosystems. Yet, as predicted by many of these days, including Clay Christensen, author of Disrupting Class, we're going to see a lot of consolidation and even termination of institutions in the formal higher education arena of the learning sector. But it was a thought-provoking keynote, and I digress, just to say it was all dynamic, and the speaker made that happen. She's someone to follow for sure. Her Twitter feed alone is worth a browse, and the link for it's included on the slide there on the screen. One of the more insightful large group sessions was this panel on what students really think of online learning. Started off by the dynamic Luke Dowden and moderated by Phil Hill of MindWires Consulting and Patricia James from the California Community College System, this panel led to a very active back channel, which I encourage you to check out with the WCT14 hashtag. Okay, so you probably know that many surveys have been reported on about the topic and the students selected to speak all echoed what the research has shown us about what students really want from online learning. One thing that really stood out to me as I listened to the students was their absence of knowledge of how large classes they've taken online tend to be. I found this really interesting because when I was an online learner, the learning management system gave me a list, even if just in the email feature of fellow students, and I could always gauge the size of my class by participants as well in the online discussions. However, these students didn't seem to know at their institutions how large their classes were, and importantly, suggested they didn't really have any issue with large class sizes. But what we mean by large seemed a bit ambiguous in that conversation, and I was left wanting to know more. I might have misunderstood. But what this made me think of is that these students had not been taught effectively with collaborative learning experiences. It seemed the element of classroom community, that sense of connectedness and sense of learning that Alfred Revise and even my own research has discussed in terms of online learning was just not developed for these learners and their experiences online. Another main point I gleaned from this panel was the students' emphasis on their experiences with high-stakes testing. I was really appalled and actually saddened to hear that their online learning had been so traditional in that sense and with midterms and finals, experiences, and nothing more authentic in terms of their learning activities and assessments. But again, I might have misunderstood. Another big panel idea that this was emphasized was the quality engagement in the online classroom, and here's a place you'll really want to listen up. All the students agreed it's not the quantity of interactions with the faculty or their fellow students that mattered in their learning, but the quality of interactions. Of course, having quality assurance processes that measure quality of interactions is much more subjective and difficult to implement for institutions than a quantitative requirement for interaction. In all, I think that was a really powerful point that it's not how much, it's the quality of what is taking place in the classroom. So in all, it was great to have the student voice at the conference, and I hope we have more of these at the WCT in the future, including roundtables with student groups discussing issues such as class size, assessment, faculty presence, and so forth. Hopefully, we'll see more of these in the future. A smaller session I attended that was also engaging was this one on badging, badges in higher ed exploring the policies and possibilities. And it was one 
that influences higher education today in the sense that badges are becoming ever more popular. The panel itself included an all-star cast that discussed a framework for institutional policies for badges, gave an overview of the federal policy context that affects how students can scale the badge movement on their campuses, and the panel introduced the work of the Badge Alliance, which is a network of organizations and individuals that are working to create and build a system to support open badging, not just any badging, but open badging and the ecosystem of badging that we have today. I literally have a page of notes from this session, but to be brief and try to summarize the key points, Note that there was some emphasis on the MOOC, the Massively Open Online Course, which is around, um, linked to this particular topic, and the link for that is on the slide if you're interested. The emphasis was that this open learning opportunity is a really great consolidated space to learn about and even earn badges. Deb Everhart also emphasized that badges are becoming more widely accepted as a currency for professional credentials and cited examples of major corporations such as Walmart and Microsoft and other companies who are using closed badging systems. The session definitely geared towards promoting open badges, which I'm in favor of, one with interoperability of badges and standard quality assurance for the merit of badges awarded. An idea that came from this session is the need for college transcript translators. It occurred to me, that is, during the session, that we need an automated system somehow to convert a standard college transcript into a badge and its competency equivalents. But right, this is going to require a lot more standardization of the college curriculum across the board, and that's a topic big enough for an entire conference for sure much more than this summary can cover. Those of you viewing the summary who are familiar with the Common Core initiative in the K-12 sector or Common Core's numbering and descriptions in some systems in higher education already will know that this is a political topic to say the least. But there is hope with initiatives such as Lumina Degree Profile and at least, well, I digress again, badges. A couple of other key points about badges related during the session were that badge acceptance starts with endorsement, often moves to partnerships with industry, then ideally to a form of accreditation. This defines the continuum of acceptance and currency of badges. So that's something to take note of if you're looking for a framework for examining badges at your own institution in terms of their credibility and acceptance and currency. The presenters all emphasize that if using badges to remember to align them, allowing them to standards and to marketplace needs as essential. This can be set of competencies, of course, which are practices performed in betting and, comp and the badges after all. Um, simply stated, badges align to something meaningful or they're useless, so they have to have value. And that's the underlying push for the open badge movement is to define that value, standardize it, and make it have a currency that goes beyond the individual's efficacy and into the marketplace. Another session I attended was one I felt a bit out of sorts in, only because it was geared towards current or aspiring administrators. And those of you that know me know that I've always, even though I've held some administrative positions, I tend to shy away from these opportunities for many reasons. Still, I work with and for administrators, so I thought this session would be helpful for me to know what some of my peers in these positions are struggling with and to learn from a provisional leader whom I admire greatly, Luke Dowden, and his session did not disappoint as I learned several things that can assist me in my non-positional leadership domains. So the session was leading in online learning, insider tips on sustaining success, and again, the speaker was Luke Dowden, who's Director of Distance Learning at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. So Luke emphasized in the session how prepared leaders are a key component to experiencing institutional success in the online marketplace, and he shared his personal application of Cotter's eight-step process for ch leading change as a framework for a lively discussion by participants about their leadership challenges and successes. I did get kind of hung up in the session trying to delineate among the idea of developing a coalition and how that would differ from a work group or task force, Luke responded to my question asking for clarification by noting that in his practice, a coalition is a driver of change on a larger and more longitudinal scale. And in that sense, I liken the coalition idea to being a prolonged task force with clear missions, expected performance outcomes, and measurements in place. In other words, don't just get people together and say, we're going to change the world. Have a plan, have a mission, have a roadmap, and have performance measures where you can gauge your success and be accountable not only to each other within the group, but to some external body within your institution or even beyond the institution. A key to Luke's successes has been giving everyone a voice in the process of change. So he's really, really great at it being inclusion, inclusionary, and getting people involved at his campus. If you're not familiar with Cotter's eight-step process for leading change, I highly recommend some research in the area. 
Probably the most useful bit of advice I gained from the session was that we are wise to avoid creating policies that paint us into a corner. This is great advice to remember for me and my practice as I often advise on policy creation, and this bit reminds me to think three, six, or even ten years or months from now as each policy decision comes around to think in a scenario-based way about how the policy will actually function amidst the ecosystem of other policies and disruptions that are constantly occurring and can occur around that policy's implementation and the evaluation of its effectiveness. So thinking ahead, again, check out Cotter's Eight Steps. They're available online from many sources. Next, I'd like to highlight another keynote that started off with a few words by the new director of WCET, Mike Abiati and was followed by presenter Nancy Zimfer, the Chancellor of SUNY. Zimfer noted that by 2025, projects in some areas are projecting that 60% of job opportunities in the United States will require a bachelor's degree. Meanwhile, in her state, where SUNY operates, there are in New York nearly 7 million adults with only a high school degree and no college degrees. So Open SUNY, which is the state of New York's vast new online learning platform, was discussed as a model for how university systems can harness technology to reach current and potential students on their terms and in large scales that only systemness, so to speak, can accomplish. She noted how the anytime access means that students are not prevented from taking classes they need to graduate and how this learning model of Open SUNY speeds completion for college and helps reduce student debt load in the process. I was pleased really to hear about this initiative and its success and was reminded of the dream that was CCC Online, the Colorado Community Colleges Online, for operating as a similar consortial hub for community colleges in the state of Colorado. There was CCC Online too, a place where I spent 12 years of my professional life. I saw where student access to courses they need and when they need them was a key attribute to the model's success. So great job to open SUNY for paving the way for university systems. It's just too bad, in my view, we don't have more national consolidation of all state universities, allowing university learners to learn from any institution of higher learning wherever and whenever they want, and we're still stuck in our state silos. Yet that would require a lot of interstate collaboration and regional collaborations, and we're just just not there yet, but I'm confident organizations such as WCT will continue to inform and drive these collaborative initiatives. Again, great job to Zimfer, the Chancellor of SUNY, and their initiative for bringing access and availability anytime to students to learn so that they can get those higher education credentials and also the benefits of higher education and take that into the workforce. One of the best sessions I attended was the Invent the Beyond session by Mick Garn of University of System of Georgia, known as one of the most innovative systems in the United States, and where I proudly began my professional path in distance learning, as it was called in the 1990s. Garn discussed how higher education is amidst a sometimes turbulent change and noted that the rate of that change and unpredictable and unrelenting emergence of new models makes planning and preparing for the future sometimes conflicted, confusing, and of course critical for the service to and success of the learners we serve. So he discussed how predicting the future is problematic but noted that they've had successes with scenario-based planning and has increased the availability of stakeholders to envision the future possibilities and challenges that are sustainable because they consider solutions comprehensively through counselors. He also spoke of how Georgia is inviting the world to join as co-authors in a massively open online collaboration, another term for MOOC, and it's a scenario-based strategic thinking and planning process that will define success factors and new business models needed to succeed in an evolving academic ecosystem and educational marketplace. Okay, that's a mouthful for saying this MOOC is really geared towards predicting the future in a crowdsourced way. The MOOC is available from D2L's open course sites, and the link for that is on the screen. I've signed up, and I hope if you're interested in the future and present of higher education, you will too. Look for the Invent the Beyond course at the website. Registration appears to be open through the end of November of 2014, so hope to see you there. The next session I'd like to highlight was from Brian Warden with my alma mater, Capella University, discussing their FlexPath degree option. Warden spoke of how in Capella University they launched FlexPath, which is the first federally approved competency-based direct assessment program at the bachelor's and master's level in the United States. He noted how FlexPath has been the focus of a lot of attention in the last year and continues to be the focus of students, employers, and other institutions, and that led to the program receiving one of the WC. Wow Awards, and as a result, this unique and innovative program was not just awarded the award, but has provided 
the world with some really valuable information in terms of their data analytics from the initiative. And so uh, he discussed some of the results they've compiled and talked about the future of FlexPath. I literally have a few pages of notes from this session, and it's really too much to summarize here for the purpose of the learning summary. What suffices to say is that FlexPath is not a trend or a flash in the pan or half thought through initiative. It has real potential to be a forceful disruption in the higher education models, not just a capella, but beyond. By being a competency-based outcomes assessment university, Capella was already aligned strategically to convert to competency in this program. And so those other competency-based institutions that are out there might want to take note about the sustainability and transitions that FlexPath had within Capella University as a success model. So speaking of the WOW Award that FlexPath won, the WCT Awards Lunch, besides being delicious, was a fun celebration of outstanding achievement and innovation from the WCT community, who are the recipients of the 2014 WCT Outstanding Work, or WOW Award. So you have Capella University for FlexPath, you have the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee for their UPACE instructional method, the Northern Virginia Community College, or NOVA Extended Learning Institute, OER-based associate degree project, and a really exciting development development from Excelsior College, a free open source online writing lab which has some really great things on the horizon for its future for scalability to other universities. And then there was Colorado Technical University for their IntelliPath MBA preparation. All these initiatives are worth exploring, so do some looking around for them online and see the WCT website pages dedicated to the award winners is a great place to start in my advice. Congratulations again to all the winners, and again, as a side note, I've already recommended the online writing lab to my students. This open source writing lab initiated by Excelsior is very, very, very impressive and commendable as an open source initiative. Next up was a long discussion about competency-based education with an all-star cast of speakers who talked about their role and the initiatives they're exploring for CBE. The session explored four key areas of competency-based education implementation, change management, the academic model, technological supports, and regulatory approvals. The short link on the screen will provide you the materials from the session to help you think through CBE at your institution. So check out that link and you'll find some framing questions that you can use at your institution. And I'm sure any of these speakers from you know some rock star places such as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to Brandman, Western Governors, Capella, Higher Learning Commission, Loud Cloud, you name it, where there was representation from all parts of the industry sector. And I'm sure these folks would be happy to follow up with you. A really engaging session with lots of important information. Another session I attended was a panel from accreditors for some of the regional accreditors. These panel members started off by emphasizing how higher education accreditation in the United States is a process intended to engage member colleges in quality assurance and encourage peer institutions to improve teaching and learning outcomes. Okay, that said, questions in the session focused on how accreditation groups are responding to an academic world that includes innovations such as competency-based education, e-learning, online learning, prior learning assessment, and what we call alternative providers of learning such as MOOCs and badging initiatives. One major takeaway from the session for me was the emphasis on transcripts and alternative degree programs such as competency-based models, and whether we like it or not, the credit hour is a norm, and transcripts and CB initiatives have to adhere to that norm to some extent. But I did leave the session encouraged, especially by Barbara Bino's comments, that accreditors really do want to see innovation in areas of access and affordability from member institutions without a sacrifice of the quality of faculty and student experiences in the learning process. The doors seem to be open with all the accreditors for conversations about how to innovate and not sacrifice quality. So I look forward to seeing the evolution of the accreditation processes in step with the amazing transformations of models in higher education that we see today at so many institutions and that were so widely represented at the WCT conference. So those were most of the really important, exciting sessions that I was able to attend at WCT, but not a sampling of all that was available by any stretch. So next, a quick review seems prudent of the session I presented and then co-presented presented about at the conference. The session on creating a culture of online collaborative course design was one where I presented about the process of piloting a course design process at Ashford University and noted how the revised process for online course design 
created a collaborative course design experience and is producing more collaboration and increasing the already effective courses and programs we have at the university. I focused the session around discussing the process we use for course design in the College of Education as it relates to culture changes, personnel and process recalibrations, and I shared several examples of our successes and challenges thus far with the revised process. If you're more interested in hearing about this process for design, which includes a handbook and over 20 worksheets, guides, and templates to support it, and is framed around the backwards design model of Wiggins and Matee, and infuses principles for motivation design from the ARCS model from John Keller, feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to discuss them with you at any time. And the next session was intended to be a trio of presenters, but ended up with just myself and Daryl Yarrow of Colorado Mountain College facilitating. We explored how technology has led to greater differentiation and specialization within the faculty role, and we considered the variation of roles and instruction that exist along the continuum from MOOCs to small group seminars. We talked about the evolution of expertise in a connected world where information and knowledge are easily accessed outside of the faculty expert domain, and we collaborated with participants in the session in a dynamic building of a slide titled Faculty Roles, and you can see that on the screen. The collaboration resulted in a list of what the participants deemed common and uncommon roles for faculty today, and a list of roles shared at various types of institutions. This was a very engaged session, and the attendance was great considering we presented so close to the end of the conference. So a big thank you to everyone who attended not just this, but the other session as well that I presented at WCT. I'm so grateful to everyone who could help make these presentations a success. Thank you, Daryl, and thank you, WCT. You can see both presentations and all my conference presentations that I typically share publicly on my SlideShare account. And that account is listed here on the screen. Uh, speaking of which, there I am, a cheesy photo next to the conference sign and a snapshot of two colleague dinners I attended while at WCT. You can review the conference back channel from the WCT14 hashtags or my tweets from the conference dates via my Curious Mind Twitter presence. I've also placed my website and SlideShare links on this slide here for you to reference if desired. And thanks again to the host of our dinners and all those who attended the great conversations and inspired collegiality at the conference as a whole. All right. So with that, I'll close and thank you, a big thank you, to the City of Portland, Oregon for hosting our WCT conference. I enjoyed browsing the books at Powell's and the trek to the bookstore where I was smellbound indeed after my walk in your lovely city along the park path view on Southwest Clay and 10th. I also enjoyed my sunrise, my final day in your lovely city along the waterfront. These images are just a few I was able to take during this day, and I hope you enjoy them. Thanks again, Portland, and especially the conference organizers at this year's WCT, Megan, Callie, Russ, all of you guys, Molly, for an awesome learning event. And thank you for your time viewing or listening to this conference learning summary. I hope you've gained some insights and some takeaways that can help you and your practice at your institution.